Hey everyone, it's Sister Back um, here for a YouTube exclusive tutorial. Um, so this is not live stream; it isn't live. It's just you, me, and this Photoshop. <laughs> um, and uh, this tutorial is going to be about skin tones. So it's going to be like the how to paint uh, skin realistically video, but a little more remastered. And I I made that video a while ago. Uh, but I've learned a lot since then, a lot. Um, so I'd like to share all of that with you tonight. Um, so I'd like to thank you in advance for spending the next couple of hours with me. Uh, hopefully you, you pick something up, even if it's just the smallest thing. Um, that'll help you sort of tackle that, that digital art shift or, or that shift into color or shift into acrylics or just playing with color in general. Um, as artists, we're expected to be able to draw people. Um, it's hard to call yourself an artist. Um, I, I know it's mean to say that, but it's hard to call yourself an artist nowadays if all you draw is chickens. Uh, you have to be able to, um, you know, portray characters, portray people, portray, um, uh, por you know, portraits of people, uh, and represent um, uh, different uh, beings in a different setting with a different story and to be able to do that you really gotta learn the dynamics of human skin and being able to portray living skin, skin that looks alive. Um, there are some rules that people need to remember, artists need to remember before they jump in and do anything that has to do with skin. Um, some color rules, laws of color. Um, the first rule in this case, and after this, after I set up these rules for you guys, I'm going to actually paint a color, um, a colored skin with you, and uh, I'm going to talk. I'm going to sort of uh, apply the rules that I talked to you about. Okay, so the first set of rules, uh, the first rule is that skin values are high. Remember, what a value is is the dark and white of the formula of the color. So if you want to make um, an orange you have to have, let's just get the orange first and then break up that orange into different, in, into its components. So we've got this, by the way I'm using the same brush as that video. <laughs> uh, all of you love this brush. Um, so this is an orange, this is not a skin tone color, it's just an orange for the sake of the demonstration. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is showing you the different components of this that go into making this orange. So flatten. Shit. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's look at it. The first part of this color is its value. So I'm taking away the colors right now and I'm getting the value of the color. This is the color without the color. This is the color with just the blacks and whites involved. This is the grayscale version of the color. Some of you are just starting out. For those who already know what this means, bear with me a second. Get, colors are um, come from light, and light is light. Light is the illumination behind the frequency of that color. Uh, light comes in different values, and which means different frequencies, um, and, it, and it's the, in those intensities it can entertain a certain kind of color, whether it be red, blue, orange, yellow, green, whatever. Um, when you want to talk about a color, it's like what you're talking about, the splitting of that initial white light through a prism, and then you get the rainbow. Um, it, initially all of these colors had a value and after the break they also divided up this white light into different values and this white light divided up into uh, different possibilities um, that this white light can exist in different frequencies. All of that is a bu bunch of um, sciences on the side for those who are interested. But essentially what I want you to take from that is colors don't just exist because of that. They don't just become colors. There, there is a great formulation happening. Um, one of those formulations, there's two, um, is the grayscale value. How much light is involved. This is not a representation of how dark the color is. This is a representation of how much light the color has. Um, how much light the color has means how much thereafter the hue can come through. The hue of this color is the DNA, the actual identification, the, 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 what is the word for that? The, um, the, the unique identity 
of that specific color and its general placement on the rainbow. This is orange. This is between red and yellow. This is the orange. In order to have an orange, you must get the orange first, it's like in Minecraft, if you're crafting something. Um, you need the orange first and then you need another thing that unifies itself with this orange component and then we get this specific orange. So this value affects this hue to produce this color. So on to the point that I was making. Skin tones need a higher value because that's how skin tones come in. There are different kinds of skins in the world um, and there are Asian skins, Caucasian skin tones, um, there's different kinds of complex complexities, complexions, uh, which means uh, the kind of, of reds in the face, the kind of colors in the face, the kind of pigmentation in the face, the kind of race behind that face. Um, there are darker African uh, skin tones um, and it's really difficult to think about skin tones generally. Uh, that's why I have to redo this video for you guys because um, the first video that I did gave you one kind of skin tone that you can paint in. So now all of you can only paint in that one beige, Caucasian olive skin tone color. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be painting something similar, but I'm not not before I explain to you the possibility or the formulation of other kinds of skin tones, how to paint other skin tones. Um, so now that we've established that skin tones need or come in a certain value it'll be easier for me to divide for you the different general kinds of skin tones out there so for for Asian, Caucasian let's start with first Caucasian skin because it's the lightest um, no elitism here or anything like that oh gosh um, so Caucasian, Asian, Caucasian skin tones uh, come in very very light so let's take a look at this girl here. Um, Caucasian skin tones. Uh, before that, let me talk about skin. Skin it comes in layers. Uh, where the real pigmentation on the skin happens is over here, this little area here. Um, and it's sort of the outermost layer of the skin where it all really happens. The lowest most layer is the fat. And I talk a lot about the fat in my portraiture lessons, and I talk a lot about how the fat sits on top of the um, muscles and on top of the skeletal structure, um, and it sort of is the difference between a bony cheek or a uh, or a, you know a more circular cheek or a more curved cheek. So uh, this area here is where we determine how much of the skeletal structure is visible in a portrait. This is very essential, but it's not uh, specific to today's lesson. But I do want to point to it. Um, over here, this layer here, and the layer on top, um, what we get is the pigmentation. And the pigmentation is the actual color in your DNA that is uh, determining whether or not you're uh, white or, or, or darker. Um, so when we want to think about the actual color of the skin, how much of the skin is a really color of the skin, where it's really happening, it's happening in this specific layer here. This upper layer here is where moisture sits, so moisture, is Isabrak, what does that have to do with anything? Um, it has a lot to do with the way the color is distorted. So when light hits the color, um, and the color of the light is usually a yellow gold, or um, it'll distort the actual feed of that skin tone color. Then you've got the blood vessels. This is the layer of the blood vessels. The blood is always red no matter what um, race you are. And it's a very acidic red. Um, before it oxidizes, it sort of turns into a bit of a darker red, a more warm red. Um, but after, but before, um, after it oxidizes, it turns into a warmer red. But before, it's a very acidic red. Okay, so now we have these two intense layers of skin, or layers of the skin system that we have to start thinking about. The moisture upper layer of the skin, where hair and moisture sit. Then we've got the pigmentation layer over here in between um, the blood and the upper layer of the skin. So blood, pigmentation, upper layer of the skin. Pigmentation also happens up here a little bit, um, but this is pretty much where the pigmentation is chosen. It's the dermis. Um, epidermis is just part of the sort of uh, the whole the skin. So you can sometimes if you have some of you are crazy enough to have done this, you get a pin on the tip of your finger and you can like sort of 
push the pin into your finger uh, under your skin and that's really the uh, epidermis that you're piercing. Um, when you're getting a shot the epidermis is pierced as well as the dermis into the blood vessels and that's where they're sort of leaking uh, the flu shot um, uh, liquid in. Uh, so the, you're, you've probably experienced both of these. They're not that distant into your biology and under your uh, structure that, that, they know, that you haven't been acquainted with them. You're, you've been acquainted with these layers here. They're not that alien. Um, so the point of this is this is where the pigmentation really happens. When you choose your base color for the skin, this is what you're choosing. When you're choosing your uh, dark color or your shadow colors, they all have to be based off this initial color because this is where the pigmentation happens. This is the pigmentation color that we choose whether or not there's light shining on it. This is the actual DNA pigmentation. Um, it's a pre I know we can't see anything without light, but let's think about it as if there was no light in the room. What is the uh, actual underlying denominator color? that is happening and this is the color and this is the number one most important color to choose it determines how dark you're going how saturated the skin tone is and out of these out of this base tone color you choose everything so let's choose a base tone color um, I'm gonna choose something in the middle some sort of olive color that I want to guide you through because most of the illustrations are going to be expected to do are going to be wanting this kind of skin tone. Anything else you probably need a reference for it, but this is the most general, I guess, skin tone we find in illustrations today. So I'm going to choose a base tone layer that is both light, saturated, and with the right amount of redness in it. So when I say saturated, for those who just started out, those who know it, bear with me. Saturation is how much light is in the color. The more light, the more of the color we get. Because if we think about it, the more light you're taking away, the less of the color we see. The more light you're giving, the more of the color that we see. The more the, the color is allowed to shine through. Um, and that's it. Uh, so when we're thinking about a base tone color, we want to make sure that it's somewhere in the sweet spot where it's a nice olive tone color, very peachy but not too pink or pale. Um, that's usually the color even in real life that people and women really go after. They sort of tan themselves to get that perfect color or, uh, le or really darker girls want to bleach themselves to get that lighter color. I know it's sick but, but nobody seems to want what they have. Um, <clears throat> but essentially it's the, it's the color, the reason why it's so uh, sought after is because it isn't too um, distant from the color, color, the other colors. So it allows the other colors to sit on it without the other colors being too vibrant or being too dark compared to it. It's a very mid-tone skin color. So this is especially important to women when it comes to makeup because um, this kind of skin tone can get away with green eyeshadow and blue eyeshadow and purple eyeshadow and black eyeshadow. Um, it's sort of a skin tone that allows all the different colors of the color wheel to apply to it. There are some colors that really, really light, pale skin, uh, skin girls can't wear because it's just so bright against their skin, so they have to find a, a varied version of that, of, of that, um, that eyeshadow color that matches their skin in value. So this value is somewhere in the mid-tone, and that's why everybody wants it. So that's why I'm, I'm going to be teaching you that one. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to push it into the yellows a little bit because I will be choosing a blush color. So this is a pretty good shade. This is what I'd choose if I was painting, um, you know, just any face. And this is my base tone color. Uh, this base tone color is determining for me the actual denominator color for the uh, pigmentation of this human being. All right, so what's important next? So I have to start determining how dark I want to go and how light I want to go. So I have to choose a shadow color, and I have to choose a light tone color. All right. So when I choose a shadow color, I first have to, you know, I'm lost. Where, what am I choosing? How, which direction am I going on the color wheel? So before I do any of that, I realize I need to get the light source color involved, because the reason why, what the next best, most important color, the next most important color in this skin painting experience is the actual light source that's allowing me to see this color. Because remember what I pointed to, I pointed to this upper area here that distorts the color and um, reflects color back, whether it's because of hair or reflective hair or reflective skin, um, because of moisture or, or 
the way skin looks because of the reds shining on the light, I mean the light shining on the reds, whatever it is, this light is doing a lot of work and it's, it's causing a lot of trouble, so we have to consider it. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm choosing the actual, actual light source color. It's going to be a little bit less than the light source because light sources are pretty bright, but it's somewhere in no man's land, as you guys know about it. So this is no man's land. These colors are very artificial. They can only exist in, exist in neon light source colors. Everything out, outside of this, look underneath this line right here, are colors that can exist on material and objects objects that are not light sources. Over here, this is just way too dark. No color can really get this dark in real life, in real life unless it is a black hole. Black hole does not allow light to come through. So zero light means black hole. Um, <clears throat> or a vacuum. Uh, but that still doesn't... yeah, never mind. Black hole. Uh, so this color in between here is where material happens. These are the colors you choose for materials. Whether it's, it's metallic materials up here, just not in no man's land, or um, a little bit in no man's land because your metallic materials are reflective and they can reflect the actual uh, value of the light source, but that's another day. Um, and then we've got the darker tones here for material. And skin is part of the material, so we have to make sure that we stay within the man's land and stay away from no man's land. <clears throat> So what am I doing? I am choosing the light source color and I'm entering no man's land a little bit and I'm pushing this up into the yellows because I want a warm light source color. So I chose it. Here is my light source color. Extremely bright but very vibrant and it's really going to guide my, my base tone somewhere. So when I choose my light source color I have to go jump onto the color wheel. So give me a moment to open that up for you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. I should have prepared my resources folder before I started. Uh, okay, so the opposite of yellow on the color wheel <clears throat> is purple. And what it's doing is, is it's telling us, one second, it's telling us that um, wherever there is no light, there should be the opposite, both in value of what the light is. So we're getting a shadow where there is no light because light is the opposite of shadow. But don't forget, the light source has a color too. And the color also needs to be opposed in the shadows. And that's why we cool down the colors. Because relatively, in the absence of one color, we almost see the actual other color. Because colors act very funny when they're around each other. Um, a gray can look green beside other colors. Um, or a green can look gray beside really saturated colors. It's a very, very funny little trick, uh, tricks that happen uh, with colors when they're beside each other. So in the absence of the light, both in pigmentation and in value, we get the cool tones. <clears throat> and the cool tones in this case will be the purples. So when I'm choosing the shadow color, and I want to purpleize the shadow color of the skin tone, here's another obstacle. How do I do this, Sister Brack? Well, you choose your base tone, you have your base tone, trustworthy base tone, somewhere in the nice saturated, but not overly saturated, not too dark or not too gray, just somewhere in the middle. A nice sweet spot. Um, I'm actually going to opt for this slightly, slightly more saturated version. Not much of a difference. Um, when I want to make this shadow color more purple, I don't go all the way across the map. I don't get my plane and fly across the map like and then just land in the purples and then just pick up a purple and go back and mix it on top of the beige. No. If you do that, stop doing that and start doing this. Um, what you need to do is jump into the reds. The reds, red is a primary color. It is part of the formula that produces purple. Blue plus red equal purple. So if you want to go to the next coolest color that can come and stay in this neighborhood, because we're not bringing in some pastel purple from from Timbuktu for to to a beige um, beige skin tone from from Atlantis. Okay, we want to make sure that the colors we choose are in the neighborhood. So what I mean to say is, this beige here is somewhere around this area, somewhere in between this red and we're talking about purple and we're talking about this color when it's being applied with the light source getting pushed all the way into the yellow so we can't go through the greens and the turquoise and the blue and then get to the purple what we do is we take the shortest route to that color and this is sort of the clue, the sort of easy way to think about it <clears throat> 
So right now we haven't applied the yellow, so I'm not starting over here. I'm starting with a beige tone that starts here. The next best thing to get to purple is to go through red. You want to travel through neighborhoods. Remember, in order to get to one door, imagine there are doors beside inside every one of these lines. In order to get through, you have to travel through every door. So at the end of the day, if you're trying to travel through this entire neighborhood, um, you're going to come out with a gray color because you're going to have to mix in the yellow and then the green and then the, and then the turquoise and then the blue and then the navy and then the purple and that's not how you do it. When you want to cool down a beige tone from orange, and you want to cool it down, you go to the reds. Reds have cools in them. They can offer this to you. They provide the service. So when I want to cool this tone color, this this beige tone color down to get my shadow, um, I need to saturate it as well as travel it into the cools. So I'm darkening the color, but I'm traveling along the saturation line on the color picker this is the saturation line. If you, if you, you as the listener, darken colors like this, you are very, very mistaken. This is the digital dark version of that color. When you want to darken a color properly, especially for skin, you want to saturate as you go down because you are losing color while you go down. Remember what I told you, skin is all about the light source all about the value and all about the value component that plus the hue equals the color. So if you want to darken the skin tone and you darken it just by adding black, which is what this line here does, you are taking away color. You are bringing it into green. This compared to this looks green to me. It looks almost like a green. It looks like you're inventing some sort of dark tone to it. Um, it's getting that green touch, that desaturated stuff. And that's not good. What we want is a saturated shadow color. So we don't only want to travel along the saturation line, because now we're getting the saturated dark version of this. And this is not a shadow color because it hasn't, it's still too warm. What we want is that version, but cooler. So how do we do that, Mr. Rec? Start off where you wanted it, travel along the saturation line, meaning we're getting darker, but we're also saturating. And then we move the, the, the color slider down. And look at that pretty cool, nice, yummy shadow color that we got. It's a bit red. It's a bit overstated because I just want to demonstrate it to you. Um, uh, but that's essentially what I want you guys to do. Uh, I'm not sure if this is reading very well on the screen either. <clears throat> Let me do that one more time. We're traveling through the saturation line. So give me a second. It takes me a couple seconds really to determine exactly the kind of color I have the instinct for at the time. I usually just mess around. Just try to pinpoint the perfect color to make sure that it's both dark and cool and saturated. So to me, it looks like I'm almost there. I might want to go a little bit lighter. Okay, I think that's a good spot for me. So this is going to be my shadow color. This is going to be my base tone color. What I just did, if you compare it to the first How to Paint Skin video I, I posted like three years ago, um, it is both the under shadow reds that I referred to, so I term them the under shadow reds. I am considering both the blood that is going to be needed to be represented, the blush and the blood, and the saturation and the coolness all in one color. And that is called efficiency as a painter. If you guys want to really get your, you know, your train moving faster along your pr painting process, you want to hit as many birds with one stone as possible. And so I'm hitting many birds with one stone, the coolness, the saturation, and the darkness, um, and the reds that are going to be needed for, uh, for the blush later on. If I want to bring in an acidic pink for, for accent or for makeup, I will, but you need these colors first. Next up, some of you have noticed, and there's a reason why I put the light source color beside the beige color, there's a little space here. I literally get the base tone and brush the light source color on it. And now I have the light tone color for that skin. 
I also am going to need to saturate and redify this beige tone because I haven't really done that this light tone. Why? Because there is an under light red that happens. So these light tones happen oh, actually this is between this and this. So this is considering the blush in the lit areas and this and this are considering the blush in the darkened areas. So what have we learned? Um, this is messy. Uh, what have we learned? We've learned that there is so much happening that's affecting the initial color that we chose that it's it's so important to know the exact color you want to choose um, and it's important to plan that and it's at this at this choosing at the choosing of this color that you choose the race so it means that this level here is this phase this stage of color choosing color picking is the stage in which it is, it is, you know, you're, you're tested, your observational skills are tested, and that's why it's so important to have a good reference at hand to guide you through the color wheel, to know exactly how saturated that Asian skin tone is, or how desaturated the kind of pigmentation that that skin tone is, um, and how to duplicate it. And this is getting likeness. It's always good to work from reference, because you're building a visual library that is geared from... Uh, that's anchored by realism. It's not good to do studies and pick up your palettes out of studies because those are already dis displaced and distant from the real thing. That why would you reference from the, from something that's already referenced? You want to reference from the referencee um, or the, the the king of references, which is the real world. And you want to always keep yourself uh, anchored to the real world because that's what we're duplicating. And we're trying to get all the laws of realism going on. That's why I'm showing you a scientific diagram of, 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 of skin because we're, we're, this is what we're doing. We want to be artists and want to be active observers and we want to be able to understand what it is that we're trying to duplicate. Don't just get a bunch of skin tones and start blending and hope to God it looks good. And if it does, you say, well, yeah, that was my skill. <laughs> Um, no, it wasn't. It was an accident. Um, it's only your skill when you do it actively, when you do it consciously, when you're doing it in a way that is um, uh, sort of learned, a way that is aware and conscious of the real sciences that underlie all this physics. And remember, you are drawing a biological entity, something that exists in the real world, something that, and this is the key word, functions. So this skin is a functioning system. It's got blood, it's got light, it's got dermals and subdermals, um, and it's got little units sticking out of it that become eyebrows and, and mustaches, and a lot goes into understanding this, this school of thought behind um, and, uh, anything you're drawing, and it's good to always think about it in different scientific perspectives, in different perspectives in general, um, before you start observing this object. So, now that we talked about that, uh, let us talk about um, the specific kinds of skin tones. How would this skin tone change if I was drawing a Caucasian girl? And what are the... Um, so this is an olive skin tone. This is, this is sort of like a tan skin tone, very similar to mine. Um, um, I'm sort of like a Middle East. I'm Middle Eastern, not sort of Middle Eastern. So I sort of, uh, I'm tan somewhere in between all of this. So I don't get really red cheeks and I don't get really, really deep pinks in my face because I'm too tan. My skin is too dark and too not transparent to get um, the blood through it. So that's leading on to my next lesson or my next um, portion of this lesson is doing the light pale girl or the light pale skin. It doesn't have to be a girl. Um, it would be choosing this base tone. It would be a step up in the value choosing of the base tone. We're almost entering no man's land and it would be a desaturation of that skin tone. Remember, skin is yellowy, no matter what skin tone you're choosing. It's always really desaturated by itself. I really don't want to pull up a Google image of skin, <laughs> standalone skin. Um, I mean, I want to, but I don't want to disturb you guys. But you can tell here that, that this will add red, and this will add red, and this will add the yellow. Skin by itself is pretty lame. It's pretty plain color. The systems that go into it are external systems. They're not internal systems of the pigmentation chosen. So this pale girl's base tone color will look something like this. And when I want to darken it, I will darken it the same way. I will need to, if this is the light source color, I will need to redify and coolify, purpolate 
<laughs> this shadow color. So I'm moving the saturation line down and considering the reds that will be needed. And this will be the shadow color. She is pale, so yeah, this this is lighter than almost as light as this, or lighter than this definitely, because her skin tone is so light it can't entertain that level of darkness in the shadows. Let's choose the beige color. I mean the the light skin tone color. So we're basically what we're doing is we're mixing this with this. So this is this the 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 sort of skin tone for the light source. Um, areas, the lit areas. So this is the base tone, this is the under dark tone, and this is the lighter yellow tone, um, underlaying dark tone. Um, let's talk about darker, darker skin tones. So African sort of tan, deep tan, um, sort of like Indian uh, kind of skin tone. And when we're starting here, we have to start, of course, with a lower level. Um, a lower value level. So here was the mid-tone, here was the Caucasian skin, and here was the, um, I mean, the olive Caucasian, and now we're going into the African skin tones. So what we're doing is, we're, since it's one big shadow, we have to make sure we're saturating as we sh uh, choose that dark t tone. So the, the skin tone of African uh, complexions um, does have shadows and does have light spots, um, but it's not that big a jump in between them. And the most important thing to remember is not only the yellows of the light, but the reds. There are so many reds, it's almost eggplanty in nature. Um, it's like, have you ever seen the eggplant? If you have a certain light shined on it in a certain way, the purples are revealed. But if you have a light shine in another kind of way, there's browns that are revealed and deep reds. Um, so it kind of has a lot of colors hidden into it, which is very beautiful to, to sort of duplicate. Very fun for studies. Um, so what we're doing is we're cooling it down to begin with, and you really have to know exactly what shade. There are different shades of skin. Um, for girls, you probably know about this if you've ever been to the makeup section of um, Walmart or Shoppers Drug Mart or wherever you, <laughs> wherever you live. Um, but this is the base tone, so we would be starting with this. Um, and then uh, it would be, for the light source color, it would be this base tone mixed with this light source color. This would be the lighter, lighter skin tone color, and then for darker, same old. We're darkening and cooling along the saturation line, which is this curve going down to the bottom right corner of the screen. And this is a redified color, purplefied. <clears throat> so, what have we learned? The darker the skin, the less blood that is visible. Meaning, the darker the skin, the less the more opaque it is, the less transparent. Opaque means like a solid, light can't go through. Transparent means some light can go through, or all the light can go through. And then translucent is some of the light is going through. Um, let me pull up an image here. So this basically is the definition. This is a good example of what skin does. View the image. Right here, if you guys can see it before Google explodes. You see, this is what skin does. Skin is sort of porish, translucent in nature. So its translucentness is in, in by itself without the blood or the light. It's these tones here, this very base tone. And then when we add the light, and when we add the blood underneath and the darkness, then the lack of light, considered both in coolness and in saturation and redness because of the blood, we get the combination happening. So if this level here is dark to begin with, then not a lot of this red can seep through and affect the color. And if this is dark to begin with, this layer, this translucent layer, then not a lot of the light can really affect it and up its value the way light would. So that's that's something that we've come to learn today. The skin values, if they're the higher they are, the lighter the skin, the more color that seeps through. So when we're talking about uh, Caucasian skin, if we're trying to choose the blood color for the lighter areas, especially the lighter areas because there's more light allowing more color to come through, we are talking about choosing acidic pinks. 
acidic pinks are the pinks that derive from a really really primary red and it's coming out of these so if I want to choose a blush color for the cheeks and the cheeks have light on them this is the blush color that I chose I think I choose like an even lighter one entering no man's land for lips or for or for eyes and I would go even further and choose if I really want to customize the skin tone and not limit my palette I would choose an even lighter more pale skin tone reflection because if the skin is that pale then what we're dealing with is a pure reflection of the light source the skin here is withholding some of the light source revealing only the pigmentation so we'd get very yellowed skin so when I'm choosing the light blush color for, for, for pale skin, I am choosing these acidic pinks here. If I'm choosing the light source color redness for darker skin tones such as this, it would have to be in areas that are first of all illuminated, so it has to be a cheekbone or a lip and it would be this kind of blush color in those areas. So you see we can never use this on this. It is so far-fetched that you would have to have an actual lipstick that is in this color um, on this face. And let me show you what happens when we put this kind of lipstick on that kind of um, skin tone. It really, really doesn't match. It would, it, it seems like it is photoshopped. I know this is a really bad image, but do you see what happens? It is a, it is levels above the base tone that is under here. These reds here that are being revealed, very, very slight reds in between the shadows and the lights. Then we have the pure reflection here, and I'll talk about reflective and oily areas in a second and how they work like mirrors to reflect the actual color back of the light source, but do you see what I mean? This is using this kind of pink on this kind of skin tone, but if you use this kind of pink on a lighter skin girl, you'll see what happens. Let me see if I can get you a good picture. So this is pretty much the same color almost. Let me see if I can find it again. Forgive me a moment. Let me see if I can get you a good one so I don't sort of confuse you too much. There we go. So this skin tone here is almost similar to the one we saw before. But her skin tone itself lives inside the values that this color lives inside. Hers, the other girl's was a bit more pale and a bit more pastel and more purple. But if this, the other girl also wore this skin tone color, it would be really, really above her skin tone uh, because of her darkness. Um, so what we want to do, especially in makeup, because I, I worked as a makeup artist for some time in Toronto, and whenever I had to choose skin tones for, for my, my customers, um, and I didn't have that many because I didn't spend that much time being a makeup artist, um, but I would make sure that the kind of skin tone, the kind of lipstick color that I chose for them had to be a lipstick color that was almost in the same level as their foundation. So if I was choosing a foundation for a darker skin girl and it was somewhere in the deep browns, I would have to make sure that I am choosing a lipstick that is in the vicinity of that darkness because if I try to get a lipstick that would only work on a white girl, it wouldn't have no, would have never matched and, and the whole um, palette that I chose to make that girl up would have been thrown off. So I have to make sure even the blush that I choose for, like let's say I have a lighter skin customer, I would have to get the acidic pinks because deeper, darker uh, bit, uh, blushes that only work on an African skin tone would look like bronzer or would look like a big dark patch on her cheek because that blush was customized for a darker skin girl. So when we want to choose colors that sit on skin tones and we want to accessorize and, and, and uh, accent skin tones, we have to make sure that these accent, these greens and these yellows and these purples that we bring in and these reds all have to be in the same value. They have to be the same darkness or the same lightness. Okay? 
Um, another note that I made, uh, before you start thinking about um, how to paint skin, um, you have to remember that if you're a beginner, and those who aren't beginners, bear with me again, sorry. Um, if you're a beginner and you just started, and you want to start painting skin tones, and you want to do it in a, an efficient way where you're getting better, faster, sooner, remember that your vocabulary right now, my friend, in colors is limited. Your orange is the primary orange you learned in, in kindergarten. Your purple is the most basic purple that you could imagine. If you want to be a proficient artist and you want to choose your colors in a way that is both instinctive, that is classy, I guess that's the word to use, that is learned, that is tasteful, um, you want to make sure that you are thinking about the way different colors act in different values and the way colors act beside each other. Meaning, ladies and gentlemen, expand your color vocabulary, do some color exercises. I have a color exercise video available in my history and it talks about how to identify the kind of problems you have with colors to diagnose yourself. Um, with your vo color vocabulary. So when you want to draw a brown person, guess what color you're going to use? Yeah, you're going to use brown. You're going to actually go in here <laughs> and you're going to use a brown. You're going to forget about all of these nuances. You're going to go, you're going to find a brown, and you're going to use that brown. <laughs> and that's it. You're going to use this. I bet you that you have already painted a color that uses this skin. And this is a, this is a legit skin tone available but I bet you that you're going to be choosing a shadow color that is the dark brown. This is almost gray. And you're going to choose a light tone that is sort of over here. And I, most of you have painted colors, skin with these, with these tones. This is, this is flat. This is plain. This is not considering the physics and the biology. This is not considering light source and, and, and the physics there. And this is a beginner mistake, and you don't have to stay a beginner in this area. You can be a beginner in f perspective, but I'm not teaching that right now, and I refuse to let you stay a beginner in this department. From now on, after watching this video, you are no longer a beginner, because you will have learned this. And in my teaching, in my private tutoring, um, in my public tutoring, I <clears throat> always say this, La art language art, knowledge, everything art is divided into two, if practice, the practice of, of art is divided into two main roads. The first road is knowledge. You learn this stuff. All of you today have learned all of this stuff. You learned it. The knowledge. What happens after you get the knowledge? So you're sitting there, you're like, oh, damn it, she gave me all this information, what the hell am I going to do with it? Um, application is what comes next. Application is what follows after knowledge. And when you got the knowledge, you got it from a learned source. And so what happens is that the application leads you back towards the level that inspired you to develop this knowledge. So it's one big system. I know this is really ambiguous and really lame and I kind of pulled it up on the spot. But <laughs> uh, this is essentially the only way really to learn is after you get the knowledge, you have to apply it or else you will not learn it. And that's it, you guys. I'm, you, you're here, you're no longer beginners. Anyone who here started as a beginner, um, newsflash, you are no longer a beginner because you know all of this already. The way to really graduate out of beginner and into practicing intermediate or into a practicing student is to start applying. So I'm, what I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to paint a face with you guys. and Hopefully I, ha I improved since the last time I painted a face and I'm kind of nervous about it. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you how to apply the skin tone, these skin tones, one of the skin tone sets to a face, um, to a human face. And, um, and no, hopefully not a non-human face. Thanks, Mr. Breck. Um, <clears throat> hopefully it'll show you that these rules really are applicable and they really make sense and they really help. And it's important to think about these rules next time you paint skin. 
um, remember the color wheel, remember the value laws, watch my video on how to, it's an hour and a half long video of free information just for you guys. Why would you pass that off? If I had a tutor when I was younger, I would be a uh, freaking Craig Mullins right now. I'm not joking. Um, but seriously, this is this is free education for you guys, and I'm doing it because you guys are out there. Um, you're these wayward wanderers, and you guys don't really have anyone to anchor you in and just hold your heads and say, do it. And I'm here to tell you to do it. Um, that's why I started this whole thing, really, is so that I could sort of give you information that's coveted and I don't know why it's coveted I don't know why people never really share this kind of information with each other but I'm here to share it with you so uh, screw them and their little clubs um, this is how you paint skin and it'll work for you and I promise <clears throat> that it'll work for you and also uh, all your stereotypes about different kinds of races and different kinds of skin tones throw those out the window brown people aren't actually brown they're yellow they're deep greenish yellow, beige, tan. <laughs> uh, white people aren't, aren't white. They're like a really saturated acidic pink color, so they're more red than white. And then we've got black people who are called black people, but they're not black, they're brown. So I don't know why black people don't call themselves brown people because that's really the actual term. It's a red, deep, bark brown. Um, sometimes it's a, it's an eggplant dark. If you go to like... Um, Africa and you get to those areas where people are so so dark um, it's really so fantastic it's like they're from Atlantis or something um, uh, the, the, just all you see is the white of the eyes and if you really as the artist trying to pinpoint the exact tone and you wanted to reproduce it into the canvas you would be choosing a purple you would be choosing this eggplant blue this eggplant purple um, these grays. Uh, you wouldn't be choosing blacks. You, you, so it's good to expand your vocabulary and teach yourself all of this information. Because how can you expect to read a book? How can you expect to read your references if you don't know the language? Learn the language. That's the number one rule. This is stuff that people pay thousands and thousands of, dollar, of dollars for in ateliers and, and years and years of practice before they pick up these rules. And I'm here giving them to you. And you don't let this opportunity pass up after you've learned this knowledge. Jump into your canvas and start dra drawing. Start applying. Because what when you apply these rules, what happens is that you record these rules. They become part of you. And when you apply them, this practice, this continuous everyday practice, every week practice, you begin to read better. And you begin to draw better in turn. So let's all get better at drawing and let's start applying this, this skin tone. So I'm going to duplicate. Um, what am I doing? I'm going to duplicate this layer. I'm not using CS6, am I? And I'm going to just select out... Actually, which one should I do? This is the one I wanted to do in the beginning. I'm kind of tired of this. Let's do this. No, 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 no. Let's do this one. No, let's do this one. <laughs> I did this one. I did this color last time. I'm going to do this one. Um, so here's my palette. And I'm going to show you in a second that these aren't the actual colors we're going to paint with f solidly. Some of these colors are going to be painted with really, really soft brush. <laughs> on really low opacity, on high transfer, um, you know, taking advantage of the transfer option on Photoshop. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I get random sniffles sometimes. Okay, so this was the base tone that we decided on. These were the two red variations, and this was the, the lighter yellow in, in the lit areas, and this was the even lighter tone that we wanted to, 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 to create. Okay, so this was the base tone that I chose. And now I'm just going to decide where I'm going to place this base tone. So I'm just going to, just without any lines, just find the general face that I'm going to be painting. When we paint faces, um, this is what I tell all my 14-day challenge private uh, students, is we have to think about the form of the face, the structure. And I've done a lot of tutorials about this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on why I, I, I sort of don't blend or blend in a certain area, because this, this lesson would be hours long. Um, so I'm going to leave that for another day. Skeletal structure and anatomy, I'm going to leave it for another day. I'm sorry. It's going to be all about color today. So this base tone here, I chose, I chose it. It's here. It's mine. I also want to choose the light source color. 
I want to choose the light source area where the light source is going to touch. So I'm going to treat this like a sphere, like it's just one big piece of beige clay. Skin colored, perfectly skin colored clay. And I'm going to be touching it with my, sort of sculpting it with, touching it, uh, sculpting it with my tools and my hands so that I could start with my thumb sort of push in eye sockets with my thumb sort of pinch out a nose and pinch out the lips and it's like I'm sculpting so sculpt think about the 3D structure think about the X, Y, and Z axis that go into the formation of a 3D formation alright so we've got this perfectly spherical thing that's following the palette that I chose do you see how everything in this case is really really light strokes so you see all of the accessory colors aren't going to be painted to the, in their full they're not going to be fully realized they're not going to be painted in their full glory it's going to be a fraction a decimal of what this color is offering me because on top of this color this is too pigmented I want this to be the over dominant color so this is what's happening we are getting this over dominant color here or dominant color I'm also going to start again choosing the darker spots so the dark spots remember there's six dark spots and a couple of light spots I'm gonna start choosing the dark spots so I am choosing the sockets the sockets are skeletal cavities that are filled in by the biology of the eye and we have a little space in between then we've got the nose the nose casts a shadow a huge shadow across the face, but a nose can't just cast a shadow. Let me say it first before I screw everything up. <clears throat> the nose casts a shadow, but the nose doesn't just cast a shadow, it sticks out before it casts a shadow, so I need to bring in some of that light source and throw it on the nose. Right over here. And then the lips cast shadows, but what do the lips do before they cast shadows? They stick out. <laughs> And so I need to show that they're sticking out. So these are light spots and dark spots that I'm painting right now. And I'm having lots of fun. And I love painting faces. Okay. What else casts a shadow on the face? Cheekbones! So I'm just throwing some cheekbone highlights here. Right across the face. Forgive me for my stuffed nose. I, I know it's difficult to listen to someone with a cold talk on and on but I have a forever cold that'll never go away and <laughs> this is the price <laughs> every education you just have to deal with my crap alright so I chose the socket and I'm just trying to shape the socket to be a more elegant sort of shapely thing eyes are the bigger thing the lips are the smaller thing triangle rule triangle of cuteness I have a video on that I'm also gonna place the shadow of the cast lip and then the upper lip faces the light because it's part of the, the mountain range that faces the light okay and I'm gonna cast the light on the chin because it faces the light <clears throat> and now we've pretty much just used everything that this shadow is giving us to create some sort of basic structure for the head. I'm going to decrease the forehead just a touch over here. So I'm just decreasing this this upper sort of forehead area just to shape out a little bit more skeletal structure. I'm going to start throwing back the quarters of the face that are receding back along the side so I'm starting to add that cubicle structure to the head. You see how I'm blending very well? Some of you copied the old video and it was really really harsh blends. Everything here is having that nice blended matte thing that skin does. Skin is sort of a uniform texture. It's like leather. It's, it's just a uniform consistency. It's like you got a, a texture and put it on repeat. At least, um, sort of non acne skin. And now I'm going to start adding the secondary light sources, light source spots, so the eyelids, which are lighter than the whites of the eyes. So 
So this is pretty much how I go about it, you know, getting that white of the... It's always the most awkward part of painting an eye. It's really hard to choose. So just find an area and then uh, continue to correct it throughout. I'm going to cast the shadow of the, of the eye socket and brow down over the eyes. And I'm going to choose a very general and stipple it inward very, very gently. No harsh lines, no outlining of the brow bone and the eyebrow. This is going to turn out to be some sort of pixie looking girl. Sort of what I fancy at the moment. She'll be our muse for the class today. Okay, and I need to add in some light for the eyebrows. Just up here. Again, this is my image of beauty. If this isn't your image of beauty, um, Find a reference that inspires you and work from it. Someone who you think is very, very beautiful. For me, I always like that um, very structured, but very, very pixie-like. Large eyes, deep sockets kind of thing. A lot of you like to forget about the bottom eyelid. Please remember to shade the bottom eyelid. It is just as important. I'm going to start, because you see how we're getting some sort of eye shape now. I'm going to start... <clears throat> sort of blending away these new values because everything is going to get darker than what it is right now or lighter than what it is right now and I don't want to go there too soon I want to have a, you know, take my time decide where I really need darks and where I really need lights so I'm zoomed in a little bit do you see how I'm zoomed out? stay zoomed out the larger your brush, the more zoomed out you are please, <laughs> I'm begging you do it as a favor for me i um, starting to decide here the kinds of folds that are going to sit on the skin. You can follow along and do the exact same strokes I'm doing. Um, it's a learning opportunity, but remember, like I said, don't copy other artists before you've copied the real world. Copy other artists um, after you've copied the real world so that you know how to read what these other artists are doing. Okay, so I'm just still deciding on the bone structure. Now I'm deciding on the nose, the kind of nose I'm working with. I have many, many tutorials on the nose, how to draw the nose, what to do with the nose. Um, and I'm just adding some basic shadows here for the nostril, where I want the nostril to be. Looking at my navigator the entire time, making sure my values are consistent. Nothing is too invasive, nothing is too... I don't even know if that's the right word to use. Uh, nothing is too harsh or, or overstated too soon. This is the most important stage of the entire painting process. Trust me, it's not detailing. Whoever told you that is a liar. Sorry, I'm really passionate about this. It's not detailing. Detailing is not the most important part of the painting. It is the value choosing spot, the form rendering, um, the, the, the sort of form decision, the, the cast shadow decision stage, and that is the when the brush is biggest. Um, and then it slowly shrinks down and then you spend, probably you should be spending most of the painting time on the deciding of shadows, cast shadows, large shadows, small shadows, and um, the early stages, that's when you should be spending the most time. It should not be in the, in, the, in the detail stage. Using the shadow color, I am just going to um, just decide on the spot where I want to place the eyes. And at this stage, if you make mistakes, it's very, very easy to fix them. And I'm starting to introduce a dark lash line. Somebody's looking sleepy because I'm doing this at 4 in the morning. Yes, I do not sleep. And so I'm just... Introducing some shadows for the upper eyelid. And shadows for the lower eyelid. They'll wake up in a second. But look at how close I am to my palette. I have not jumped into here once. Once you choose your color palette, you're good to go. There's nothing that can scare you because you have already chosen. If you want to go in there and you choose your light, your beige tone color, and then you still haven't chosen your light tone and you started painting the face, how much do you really think you're going to get out of that? You're going to make lots and lots of mistakes. 
and that's never it's never a safe place to start. It's like going in. I've been playing a lot of Minecraft. <laughs> so it's like going into a to a cave or to a to a dungeon without having your pickaxe or your sword ready. It's I know I've been playing a lot of Minecraft. That was an idiotic example, but anyway, um, <clears throat> be ready, prepare yourselves. <laughs> Sounds so ominous. Um, so this is, again, this is the, the most important part of the painting process, so naturally it will be the most anxiety-driven, um, and it'll be the part where the major decisions are being made. And don't be afraid. You're in good hands. You're in your own hands, and you're in my hands, uh, at least for the duration of the tutorial. Um, and um, it, you're, if you've chosen the colors and you know where the light source is coming from and you know where all of this is happening, all of it, all of the rest is discovery. And as I always say to my students, endurance is experience. So you just endure the application process. That's where you get the experience points. And that's where you start learning. So at this point, I'm just choosing some secondary light sources. Fixing here the lip that I decided on earlier. Sculpting away at the face with this light skinned palette that I chose. And after this is all over, this this really tedious early large brush step um, stage of the painting um, is over, I can start rendering. And rendering is when your brush starts to shrink slowly, slowly. You start to add more details, you start to add more dynamics, more physics, more anatomy. Um, and that's pretty much where we're going at this stage. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to be lightening all of this. And um, I'm going to do this into a time lapse because I'm not going to be able to explain everything. Um, every tiny little brush stroke I choose, so hang tight and enjoy the process.
this point, guys, just to sort of interrupt the process a little bit, what I'm doing is I'm bringing in a dark tone, as dark as I want the eyes to go. It might go a little bit more black than this. this. These aren't skin tones. This is, first of all, the eyeliner here at the top is a form of makeup, so it isn't um, part of the skin tone. It isn't a skin tone color. I have to bring it in from the color wheel, um, uh, as well as the dark of the pupils as well. I have to bring that in separately from the color wheel. So what you saw me do was switch my uh, switch my brush to a soft brush so I can get the big pieces considered, the big areas blended, um, so everything can be as seamless as it happens um, on skin. So I'm going to continue painting here, and you can observe slowly how my brush starts to shrink, how I'm going to start bringing in other colors like green. And, and greens for the eyes and greens for the skin and I'm going to start detailing and all of the stuff that I'm doing here I've covered in videos um, on how to on eyes, nose, lips, etc. Um, so you're just going to see me painting this particular face in this color palette that we've chosen together um, and I'm sort of going to bring it to life make it as realistic and most rendered as I possibly can.
So, that, that was a while. Um, the whole painting process was about an hour and uh, 30 minutes maybe. Um, and I just want to point out that it isn't finished and I am a bit of a perfectionist. I usually spend um, hours and hours and hours and layers and layers and the image never changes. I mean, never stays the same. Um, but as you can see, I barely went into the color picker to choose anything other than the blacks. Every color that I used in this skin tone combination, in this skin tone um, of this girl here, uh, this light skin girl, um, uh, was from this color, that we, this color set that we have uh, that we have chosen together. And um, all I want to say is, yes, she is influenced by my style. Yes, it doesn't look like a realistic person in the sense that no one is really that pretty. Um, <laughs> maybe there are. I've seen a couple of people. You can see the influence of Rachel uh, Weiss and um, and uh, when I was young, I used to think she was so beautiful. So that sort of came off into my work as I grew older. But I had a person, Weiss, Weiss, yeah, Rachel Weiss. Um, she's very beautiful. So it's sort of it's become part of my visual library. I have not used um, any have not used any uh, references for this. So this is why it looks so cliche. It looks so plain. Uh, it kind of looks like you know the same old face I'm always drawing. Forgive that though. It's for the sake of the of the of the colors that we've chosen together. Um, I I pretty much just stuck to the to the entirety um, to the whole range here, the spectrum of colors that we've chosen. I actually did go into the color wheel to get to get those greens for her green eyes and that, you know, partly hazel, partly green eyes. Um, so I did go into the color wheel to pick those out uh, and the green under her eyelid. Uh, there's a green under the eyelid. The skin of the eye is actually very transparent. There is no blood and muscle behind it. So what happens is that the skin, the yellows of the skin merge with the purples um, uh, and blues of the, of the veins. And what happens is that the green is sort of um, is the result, and it comes off as a green under the eyelids. Um, all the other rules that I used uh, to for the eyes, for the nose, for the lips, I've talked about them. And I've sort of uh, ventured away from my rules a little bit here, uh, for the sake of the eyes. Usually, for me, the eyes carry the portrait, um, and it's what I usually teach my students as well. The eyes are the most important thing to me, so that's what I detail the most. Um, I drew some basic outlines for her hair. You did see me jump into liquify a couple times, and that's because I didn't start with an initial sketch. That's something I usually do. Um, again, this is something that I skip for the sake of the lesson, just to jump straight into the colors. Um, there's a lot left of work left to do, a lot of detailing, a lot of form structure, a lot of casting of the shadows that is needed. But essentially, I've captured the face, and I really feel like skin tone-wise, color picking-wise, I'm set. And that's because the colors that we chose, we chose in a way where we were thinking about the influences of these colors and what is the result, what what causes these colors to come out. And there's a lot of distortion, a lot of color change because of the light source color that we chose. Um, and some areas look yellow almost and have deviated away from this beigey color that undertones everything. But this color did choose and help me choose all of these colors um, that merge with it. So matching your colors early on is only going to benefit you later on. And you guys, I really can't stress it enough to plan your images. Um, so I hope this tutorial helped. Again, expand, 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 expand your color vocabulary. Get acquainted with some beautiful colors. Start choosing some colors that really speak to you. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it for this tutorial. I hope it's helped. I know I've skipped a lot of stuff, and I know there's a lot of stuff that isn't really uh, making sense, and the time lapse wasn't really helpful for you guys. Um, but I, I couldn't really talk about every single brushstroke I made, because I would have talked about every single brushstroke I made. <laughs> I spared you that. Um, so it is getting late here, and um, I'm going to call it a night, and I'm going to let you guys do with this what you will. Um, hopefully it helped. Again, if you guys would like to contact me for critiques, uh, link me on Facebook or contact me on DeviantArt or anywhere else that you can reach me on Twitter as well um, uh, so I can take a look at your work for the critique hours. I hope this tutorial helped and have a great day. Bye bye.